sudah The Sangha is invited to come back to our breathing so that the collective energy of mindfulness can bring us together as an organism flowing as a river with no more separation. Let the whole Sangha breathe as one body, listen as one body, chant as one body, transcending the boundaries of a delusive self, liberating us from the superiority complex, the inferiority complex, and the equality complex. From the depths of understanding
children are invited to come across the table. You had a nice time yesterday. <coughs> now let us uh, enjoy breathing with the bell before we start uh, the Dhamma talk. Breathing in. I know I have a body. Do you have a body? Yes. Breathing in, I know I have a body. Breathing out, I smile to my body. This is a meditation. So breathing in, you know you have a body. And breathing out, you smile gently to your body. Okay? Three times. I want to take good care of my body. I have a body. I want to take good care of my body. Dear Sangha, good morning. Today is the 27th of August in the year 2013, right? And we are on our third day of the retreat, The Art of Suffering. We are in Brooklyn, Monastery, New York State. Today we shall meditate on a cup of tea. Mm. This morning, if you went with us in walking meditation, you saw Thay drinking his tea peacefully and happily. Drinking tea is also a meditation. When you look into the tea, what do you see? I see a cloud. I see a cloud floating in the tea. Yesterday, the tea was a cloud up in, in the sky. But today, it has become the tea in my glass. And when you look uh, up at the blue sky, you don't see your cloud anymore. And you may say, oh, my cloud has died. In fact, it has not died. It has become the tea in Thai's cup. So, when I look uh, mindfully into the, to the tea, I see my cloud. I say, hello, my cloud, I see you. And when I drink my tea, I drink my cloud. You know, you are made of cloud. At least 70% of you are cloud. <laughs> if you take the cloud out of you, there's no you left. <laughs> so cloud is a good subject of meditation. <coughs> uh, 
and the cloud has a good time traveling. When it uh, falls down, it does not die. It just becomes the cloud or the, the rain. A cloud can never die. A cloud can become snow or rain or ice, but a cloud can never die. So uh, the cloud become the rain. The rain become uh, the creek on a mountain, and the creek uh, flow down and become the river, and the river goes to the sea, and the uh, heat generated by the sun help the, the water in the ocean evaporate and become cloud again. So the cloud has a good time traveling and uh, wearing all kind of uh, forms, wearing all kind of appearance. You know, this the cloud has become the tea, and Thay is going to drink this tea. <laughs> and what will become this tea? It will become a Dharma talk. <laughs> <laughs> My dear little cloud, I am drinking you. You, are, you will become one with me. And thanks to you, I'm going to give a Dhamma talk to the children. Because I know how to drink my tea mindfully. That is why I can see the cloud in my tea. And I can see that the cloud is very helpful. It will help Thay to give a Dhamma talk without a cloud. No Dhamma talk is possible. <laughs> Remember, you are made of cloud also. At least 70% of you are cloud. So smile to the cloud in your tea. Smile the cloud in your body. And next time, when you are about to eat an ice cream, look. Look at the ice cream and you see a cloud in your ice cream. I think you can. If you take two, three seconds and look into your ice cream, you can see your cloud in the ice cream. Before you eat the ice cream, smile to the cloud in your ice cream first. That is meditation. That's easy, very pleasant thing to do. I'll show you something else. <laughs> I do calligraphy. I draw circles. <laughs> and you know something? There is a, there is a cloud inside. There is also the tea inside. You need to have uh, some time to look. This is a sheet of paper, some ink, a seal. But if you look deeply, and I know it, there is a cloud in this, and there is a tea also. I will explain you how. Doing calligraphy for Thay is uh, a practice of meditation. And uh, each uh, session of calligraphy begins with the tea. I never write calligraphy without having a cup of tea first. I need the tea to help me in order to be awake, in order to do calligraphy well. You know, the tea and meditation, they have been together for many thousand years. The Chinese uh, monks, the Vietnamese monks who practice sitting meditation, they found out the tea leaves, and they found out that uh, if you drink tea and then you can stay awake, you don't fall asleep, 
during your sitting meditation. <laughs> so Zen and tea have been going together for many, many years. <laughs> and that is why as a practitioner of uh, meditation, I always have tea as my companion. That is why before uh, doing calligraphy, I have the time to enjoy my tea. And do you know that I always mix some tea in my ink, in my Chinese ink. Therefore, when you look deeply into the ink, you see the tea inside. This, this is the truth. I always mix tea with ink. But uh, if you look uh, more deeply, you see something else. While doing calligraphy, I practice mindful breathing. I hold the brush and I breathe in one second, two seconds, three seconds. And during that time of breathing in, I make about one third of the circle. So there is a breathing in one third of the circle. Mindful practice of calligraphy. And when I breathe out, I finish. I do the rest of the circle. It takes about five seconds to finish. So three seconds for breathing in, three seconds for breathing out mindfully, and I finish uh, the circle. And that is why when you look at this calligraphy, not only you can see a cloud, not only you can see the tea, but you can see my breath inside. I have brought uh, and show you some calligraphy today. First, something you already know, a cloud never dies. The nature of the cloud is the nature of no birth and no death. Looking on the surface, you, you may think that a cloud can be born, can, can die. But looking deeply, you find out that a cloud can never die. The nature of the cloud is the nature of no birth and no death. And in this retreat, we are going to meditate on this uh, tomorrow, after tomorrow. Our true nature of no birth and no death. A cloud, remember, can become snow or rain or ice, but a cloud can never die, remember. And this one you already know. Smile to the cloud in your teeth. It's very nice. If you, ha if you have uh, this calligraphy in your tea room, it, go it will remind you to practice breathing and enjoy your tea more. By the way, there is a cloud also in your coffee. And you know something? When you cry, when you cry, there's a cloud in your tears. And maybe the tea that you drank yesterday has become part of your tears. And that is why I also uh, wrote The tears I shed yesterday have become rain. And the rain is going to become the tea 
and the tea will become tea again. If you don't practice, you do not know how to handle your suffering, and you continue to cry a lot. There will be a lot of tears. The tears I shed yesterday have become real. Tomorrow we will have a Dharma talk for children also. So now if you hear the small bell, stand up, bow to the Sangha, and go out and continue your practice. Stand up, facing, facing the Sangha over there. It's very beautiful, the Sangha. Bow to, to the Sangha. Have a good day. The Sangha yesterday we spoke about um, how to deal with uh, a strong emotion. I think uh, parents and teachers should know how to do it and transmit uh, the practice to the young people. The practice of mindful breathing is very important. And we should not waste, uh, wait until uh, the strong emotion come in order to practice. We have to train ourselves with that practice so that when the emotion comes, Naturally, you remember to practice. And emotion is something like a storm, and you feel that it's coming. And if you notice that the strong emotion is coming, you prepare yourself in order to, to receive it.
and to handle it. Drop anything you are doing, sit down or lie down and wait for it while practicing mindful breathing. In the sitting position or in the lying position, you breathe in and you become aware of the rising and falling of your abdomen. This is a deep breathing. For a strong emotion, we need a deep belly breathing. We breathe in in such a way that our stomach will rise as high as possible. And when we breathe out, we bring it down as much as possible. If you are in a sitting position, you may like to, to put your hand here to feel the rising and falling of your abdomen. Or if you are in a lying position, you may do the same. Instead of uh, staying here on the level of the brain and you bring your mind down, you focus your attention down here on the level of the navel. You know, when uh, there is a storm, when you look at uh, the window, you see the tree standing in in a storm. And if you look at the top of the tree, you'll see that uh, the branches and the leaves will swing back and forth violently uh, according to the wind. So our, the level of our brain is like the top of the tree. Don't stay there in the time of a storm. Bring your, your attention down to the level of the navel. And that is why it's good to observe the rise and fall of your abdomen while breathing in and out. In the sitting position or in the lying position, just focus all your attention on your in-breath and the rising of uh, rise of, uh, of uh, your abdomen. That's simple enough. And during that time, uh, keep alive the kind of uh, insight that we already have. I am more, I am much more than my emotion. I am form, feelings, perceptions, mental formation, consciousness. I am much more than one emotion. An emotion is something that comes, stay for some while, and will have to go away. I don't have to die just because of one emotion. I know I can handle an emotion with the practice of mindful deep breathing. I have survived emotions before. So we have that kind of insight we should uh, remember, we should recollect. Mindfulness means also recollection. You have insight, you know things, but you are not, you do not know how to make good use of what you know. You have the insight and you should know to make good use of your insight. The young person, she is overwhelmed by that strong emotion. She believes that she is only the emotion. She does not know that uh, she is much more than one emotion. And she believes that uh, the only way to end the suffering is to go and kill herself. That is a wrong perception. And that is why we have to remind her that she is more than a perception. That a perception is impermanent. It comes and stays for some time and you have to go. And that kind of insight uh, we can transmit to her, to him. 
maybe later on our uh, portable telephone will have that uh, function reminding us. Uh, I'm going to tell the people in Google because we shall have a day of practice together. That you should provide us with a kind of uh, electronic device that help us to come back to ourselves. And when there is a, a strong emotion, that will invite the bell for us to, to, to breathe in and out. And it will remind us, dear friend, you are more than your emotion. You can handle your emotion with the practice of mindful breathing. You have already survived many strong emotions. You don't have to die just because of one emotion. I think that kind of thing will help the young person because it helps uh, touch off the insight that already is in him or in her. And just remember, just keep that insight alive and practice deep breathing and you can survive the strong emotion very well. And when the strong emotion is gone, you say that next time it can come. I know how to handle, I'm not afraid. And if a mother knows how to do it, she can help uh, her son little boy or little daughter to do it. When the little boy has a, a crisis, a strong emotion, darling, hold the hand of mommy. Shall we breathe together? Let us breathe in. Breathe in. Oh, our stomach is rising. Our stomach is falling. Let us breathe together, mother and son, mother and daughter. You can use your mindfulness, you can use your um, energy to help the child to focus his attention on the in-breath and out-breath. And you can help, uh, 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 and together you will allow the emotion to stay and for some time and to go. Because you are a practitioner, we can transmit to the child, our energy, our practice. And you can train your child to do so. And if you can train uh, students and children to do that, uh, it may save their life. Because later on, confronting a strong emotion, then remember to practice. And they are not going to kill themselves. Because the number of uh, young people killing themselves is very big in each country. In France, in uh, uh, Great Britain, United Kingdom, the young people kill themselves quite a lot. So the mindful breathing is, is uh, to help us uh, calm down our body, calm our feelings, our emotions. And we know that um, we need the insight in order to be able to truly relax our body and calm our emotion. And insight is not something that comes later on. As soon as you have mindfulness, concentration and insight are already there in mindfulness. And if you continue, concentration will be deeper, and inside will be brighter. And with these three kinds of energy, you can deal with that, uh, whatever pain that is happening in, your, in yourself. Yesterday we have learned that uh, a practitioner knows how to generate a feeling of joy, a feeling of happiness at, what, uh, at any moment of the day. That's the fifth and the sixth exercise proposed by the Buddha in the Sutra of Mindful Breathing. The fifth is to generate a feeling of joy. 
thanks to mindfulness. Because with mindfulness, you recognize the many conditions of happiness that you already have in the present moment. And you make joy possible right away. You make uh, happiness possible right away. And that is the art, that is the art of, uh, of happiness. A good practitioner is capable of generating joy and happiness in his daily life, in her daily life, to nourish himself and to heal uh, himself. And then a good practitioner also knows how to handle the pain in him or in her. And mindfulness is the kind of uh, energy that helps you to recognize the pain, to smile to the pain. The energy that helps you to smile to the pain is mindfulness. You are not overwhelmed by your pain if you know how to smile with it. Hello, my little anger. I know you that you are there. I will take good care of you. That is smiling to your anger. I have smile to your body, but I don't have smile to your anger here. <clears throat> so as a practitioner, we should be able to smile to our anger, to our irritation. Smiling to it means you are aware of it. You don't try to suppress or to run away from it. And with the energy of mindfulness, you are strong enough to be with your anger to be with your irritation, to be with your loneliness. And the first function of mindfulness is to recognize things as they are. The second thing, the second function of mindfulness is to embrace and calm it down. Because mindfulness is a kind of uh, energy. Your anger is another kind of energy. And the uh, energy of mindfulness, recognizing the anger, embracing the anger, like a mother, a loving mother, holding her baby very gently. And you get a relief after a few minutes of practice. And that is the art of suffering. How to recognize the pain in you? How to calm down the pain in you? We have to train ourselves to do it. And we get a relief. And with other exercise of mindful breathing that follow, we can completely transform the pain, the afflictions in us. And uh, we know that uh, there is a deep connection between uh, suffering and happiness. And we have, uh, we have uh, learned that um, suffering plays a very important role in, in creating happiness. It's like uh, the role of the mud in creating the lotus flower. Without the mud, you cannot create lotus flowers. The same thing is true with suffering and happiness. You need the suffering in order to, as uh, materials, raw materials, in order to create happiness. And we know that uh, there is uh, enough suffering already there. You don't have to create more. The problem is to learn how 
to make good use of the suffering in order to create happiness. The problem is how to make good use of the garbage in order to create flowers. Because looking into a flower, you see the sunshine, you see the rain, you see the compost. It has helped nourish the flower. And the compost is made of garbage. Garbage is suffering. So a good practitioner knows how to make use of the garbage in her, the suffering in her, and make good use of it in order to create uh, something more positive like uh, understanding, compassion, joy. And this is an art, the art of suffering, the art of happiness. In Buddhism, we do not use the expression kingdom of God, but we do have the expression uh, Buddha land, Buddha country. And uh, many of us believe that the kingdom of God is a place where there is no suffering. I don't believe it. If there is no suffering, and then there is no happiness either because uh, happiness is made of suffering. It's like the left is made of the right. The left can be, cannot be by herself alone. The left has to interbe with the right. You cannot remove the right from the left. You cannot ask someone to come and bring the right to Boston and someone else to bring the left to New York. No. There are always two together. Without this, the other cannot be. That is the teaching of the Buddha. This is because that is so simple. So trying to run from suffering and look for happiness is not wise. It's impossible to to do so. And most of us are doing that, trying to run away from suffering and looking for happiness. We don't know that. Happiness is made of suffering. And what we should do is to learn how to make good use of suffering. Yesterday we have learned a very important thing. If you know how to suffer, you suffer much less. And the seventh and eighth exercises on mindful breathing are to help you to suffer you learn how to suffer. If you know how to suffer, you suffer much, much less. And then you know how to make good use of suffering to create joy and happiness. So the art of happiness and the art of suffering, they always go together. The kingdom of God is not a place where there is no suffering. Because if there is no suffering, People have no ways in order to cultivate understanding and compassion. It is by contacting suffering, getting getting in touch with suffering, looking deeply into the nature of the suffering, that understanding arises. Understanding suffering is very important. When you look, when you listen to the suffering, with mindfulness and concentration, you will come to understand the nature and the roots of suffering. And understanding suffering naturally gave birth to the energy of compassion. And the energy of compassion, once born, begins to heal, to heal yourself and heal the world. So understanding and uh, compassion are born from suffering. It's like the lotus flower is born from the mud. That is why running away from suffering is not a wise attitude. You you don't want to send your children to a place where there is no suffering, do you? Because in such a place, your your son, your daughter, 
never have a chance to learn how to understand and how to love. And that is why there is suffering in the kingdom of God. So my definition of the kingdom of God is a place where people know how to make good use of suffering in order to create happiness and love. Because if there is no suffering, there is no happiness. If there is no left, there is no right. If there is no above, there will be no below. And that is the teaching of interbeing in Buddhism. This is because that is. The teaching of the Four Noble Truths should be understood in that, uh, in that uh, light. Suffering, ill-being is a noble truth. You will ask the question, what is so noble about suffering? But uh, suffering, ill-being is also as noble as the path. <laughs> the first noble truth is uh, ill being, dukkha. It is the mud, it is the garbage, it is the suffering. And you know that if suffering is there, something is there also at the same time. Like uh, the left and the right. If you confirm the existence of the left, you have to confirm the existence of the right. Because the left can never be without the right. If uh, politically you are on the left, don't wish for the right to disappear entirely. <laughs> because if the right disappears entirely, you would disappear also. <laughs> that is the teaching of uh, interbeing. Sahabu. Koshin. Kohu. means uh, be. You are together. You cannot be by yourself alone. You have to interbe with all of us. If the right is not there, the left cannot be there either. So when God say, let the light be, the light said, my Lord, I shall have to wait. And God say, what do you have to wait for? I wait for the darkness so that we can manifest together. And God said, but the darkness is already there. And the light said, in that case, I am already there. <laughs> because the right and the left, they can only enter our, then they cannot be by themselves alone. The above and the below, the same. The subject and the object. The creator and the creator. Created. All pairs of opposites are like that. And that's why when the Buddha 
confirms the existence of, of ill being. He confirms at the same time the existence of well-being. If well-being is not there, ill-being cannot be there either. And well-being is the third noble truth, and that is the cessation of ill-being. Well-being means the cessation of ill-being, the same thing. It is like uh, light. Light is the absence of darkness. If darkness is not there, light should be there. And that is why when we confirm the truth of well-being, we confirm naturally the existence of well-being, the left and the right. Suffering cannot be by herself alone. Suffering has to intervene with uh, happiness. But there are a pair of opposites among many pairs of opposite, like birth and death, beginning, ending, being, non-being. And uh, later on in this retreat, we will learn how to transcend pairs of opposite in order to touch uh, the ultimate nirvana, our nature of no birth and no death and transcend all kinds of fear and discrimination. So confirming ill-being, you confirm at the same time well-being as something that is possible. And then if there is ill-being, there must be a way of life that leads to ill-being. A path leading to ill-being your way of life. You have lived in such a way that have made uh, you being possible. So looking into the first noble truth, you can see the second noble truth, which is uh, the making of your being. Samudaya. You don't have to look for, for the second noble truth elsewhere. Just look into the first noble truth and you find the second. Suppose you have a depression. Your depression represents ill being. And if you look deeply into your depression, you find out where it has come from. You have lived in such a way in the last six months that it has made your depression possible. So looking in the first noble truth, we can see the second noble truth. You have consumed in such a way that make uh, ill being possible. In Buddhism, we speak of uh, the making of ill being also as a path, the path leading to, to ill being. The fourth, not, the fourth noble truth is also a path, but a path leading to well being. The path of well being. So the second noble 
truth is a kind of path also, the path of well-being, the path leading to your being. And if uh, the noble path leading to well-being begins with uh, right view, And the path leading to your being must begin with the opposite, wrong views. It's so simple. <laughs> it's easy enough. And this path of well-being, the path that uh, leads to well-being is called the noble path. Because every step taken on that path generates well-being. The other path cannot be described as uh, a noble path. It is a noble truth but it's not a noble path. And we, we can call it an ignoble path. <laughs> because each step made on that path generates ill being. Why each step made on this path generates well being? Well-being can be found in every step, in every breath. And ill-being also can be found in every step or every breath. Hell and paradise are both available in each step. But in, in the teaching of uh, Buddhism, the, the, the second Noble truth can be described as uh, not only a path but also a nutriment, food. You have consumed in such a way that made uh, you being possible. And the Buddha taught us about the four kinds of nutrients. And if you get the right kind of nutrients, we have well-being. And if we get the wrong nutriment, we get uh, ill-being. The Buddha said that uh, nothing can survive without food. Your depression is, is always there. If your depression is always there because you keep feeding it. If you know how to deprive your depression of food, she would die, have to die in a few weeks. And that is why the practice is to look deeply into the nature of your depression and find out what kind of food you have been using to feed it in terms of uh, sensory impressions, in terms of uh, edible food, in terms of uh, volition, in terms of consciousness. There are four kinds of nutrients. Hopefully we have the time to learn about these uh, four nutrients. Because the way of uh, mindful consumption is the way out of this uh, difficult situation of mankind. So the Buddha said, nothing can survive without food. Your love, even if it is uh, the most beautiful kind of love, if you don't know how to feed your love, it will die in a few months or in a few years. In the beginning, your love can be very precious, very beautiful. You cannot survive without it. Uh, but if you don't know how to feed your love, and in, in six months, one year, your love will die and turn into 
something else. Hate, anger, a flower turned into a piece of garbage. So your love needs food to survive. Your suffering also, your depression also. If you keep suff- suffering because you continue to feed your suffering by your way of consumption. So the second noble truth and the fourth noble truth can be described as a path but can be described at the same time as uh, nutriment. And the fourth uh, of the five mindfulness standings is about mindful consumption. If uh, we practice the fifth or uh, the fourth mm, mm, mindfulness trainings and, and uh, every day and then uh, we transform every day our suffering and we cultivate every day our well-being. I think uh, today, later today, there will be a presentation of the five mindfulness trainings and the fourth uh, the fifth, the fifth, not the fourth, the fifth mindfulness thing is about consumption. Mindful consumption will heal us and heal the world. And mindful consumption is the noble path leading us out of this uh, difficult situation of, of ours. Looking into the Four Noble Truths, we see that uh, looking that one truth contains the other three. Looking into the truth of ill being, you see the second truth, the making of ill being, the path leading to ill being, the way of consumption that leads to ill being. And if you see that uh, path, you see the same at the same time the other path. Because if uh, this path begins with wrong views and the other path begins with uh, right view. Because the noble path has uh, eight uh, elements begin with right view. So the wrong path also have eight elements. Uh, after wrong view, there will be there is wrong thinking instead of right thinking. And this is not philosophy, this is uh, the, uh, the art of living our daily life. So not only you looking into ill being, you see the second noble truth, the making of ill being, but you can see the path leading to well being. And you can see also uh, the cessation of well-being, which means the existence, the presence of well-being. So one of the truths contains all the other truths. So that is the, the nature of interbeing of the four noble truths. And we have to understand the teaching in, term, in, in that light of interbeing. There are teachers in the past who describe well-being as uh, as uh, non-conditioned. As some scripta, as some scripta, and the other as uh, conditioned uh, phenomena. But we know that there are two levels of truth the conventional level and the ultimate level. On the conventional level, we see that uh, there is birth and death, beginning, ending, being and non-being. And we can apply this kind of truth. That is why every one of us has a, a birth certificate and later on when we die, we have a death certificate. 
But if you go deeper, we find out, like the children this morning, that the cloud can never die. To die means from something, you become nothing. From someone, you become no one. And to be born means from nothing, you suddenly become something. From no one, you suddenly become someone. And if we meditate well enough about a cloud, we'll find out that the nature of the cloud is the nature of no birth and no death. A cloud has not come from the realm of non-being. That's easy to see. Look, looking into the cloud, you can see the water in the ocean. You can see the water vapor. You can Let's remind us to breathe. So a cloud has not come from nothing. She has not passed from the realm of non-being into the realm of being. And a cloud cannot die cannot become nothing. A cloud cannot pass from the realm of being into the realm of non-being. And that applies to everything, including ourselves and our beloved one. Our beloved one has not died. She is now continued in other forms, maybe more beautiful. You don't see your cloud anymore in the sky. But the rain is calling you, darling, darling, don't you see me? I'm happy here. Why do you have to, to cry like that? So getting deeper, we discover the nature of uh, no birth and no death. And we transcend all kind of fear, fear of being, fear of non-being. Both uh, being and non-beings are just notions that cannot be applied to reality. There are theologians who describe God as the foundation of being. But if God is the ground of being, who will be the ground of non-being? You cannot describe God in terms of being and non-being. You cannot describe the ultimate God, Nirvana, as being in terms of being or non-being. Let us visualize a time as a line going from left to right. And let us pick up one point in the line of time and call it B, birth. When we establish B, we have to establish at the same time D. Because if there is birth, there must be death. They are a pair of opposites. They cannot be without each other. <coughs> like the left and the right. If the left is, the right is at the same time. So B, if B is there, D should be so there somewhere, maybe 100 years later or less. So our thinking, our usual thinking is to be born means from the realm of non-being, you pass into the realm of being. So the segment ending with B 
represent non-being above and the segment beginning with B represent being you continue to be until you reach point D and when you reach point D you cease to be and you pass from the realm of being into the realm of non-being again. So the pair opposite of opposite BD goes together with the other pair, being and non-being. And if uh, we think of our, uh, in terms of, uh, of birth and death like that, and then our thinking is qualified by the Buddha as wrong thinking, because we have wrong views of reality. We have wrong views about reality because we are caught in the notion of birth and death, being and non-being. With some mindfulness and concentration, looking deeply into the nature of a cloud, we can see that a cloud is not born and can never die. And that is something that is confirmed also in science. The first law of thermodynamics say the same thing about matter and energy. You can transform matter into matter, matter into energy, energy into another kind of energy, energy back into the matter, but you cannot create matter or destroy matter. You cannot create energy or destroy energy. The true nature of matter energy is the nature of no birth and no death. And the French uh, scientist uh, Lavoisier said the same, Rien ne se crée, rien ne se perd. Nothing is born, nothing dies. So the scientists can go hand in hand with the practitioner of meditation and they can help each other. Our true nature is God. Our true nature is Nirvana, the nature of no birth and no death. And what the Buddha uh, described as a right view, right view, is that kind of insight that transcends all kind of pairs of opposite, including being and non-being, birth and death. We know that the path of well-being begins with right view. Right view. Sama Dristi. <coughs> and from right view. Mm, you have uh, right thinking and so on. So our way of uh, thinking about birth and death, being and non-being, is the kind of wrong thinking. Because the, it is based on wrong view. And the noble eightfold path, the path of happiness, the path of uh, well-being, begins with right view. And one day, a monk whose name is uh, Katyayana, Katyayana came and asked the Buddha, Dear teacher, you often speak about right view. What does it mean, right view? 
And that morning, the Buddha said, right view is the kind of insight that transcends the notion of being and non-being. This is so clear, so simple. If you are caught in the notion of being and non-being, you are caught in the notion of birth and death. You are caught in the notion of sameness and otherness. You are caught in the notion of coming and going, and there will be a lot of afflictions born from that kind of uh, wrong thinking. And uh, in the coming Dhamma talks, we will try to go deeper into that kind of teaching. Right view is a kind of insight that transcends all kind of discrimination. Suppose you, you think that the right is not the left. And the right can be without the left. That's the wrong view. That is wrong, wrong thinking. If you think that the lotus can be without the mud, that's the wrong view. Wrong thinking. If you think that you can create happiness without Suffering, that's wrong view, wrong thinking. If you think that the son is not the father, that's a wrong view, wrong thinking. When we look deeply into the son, we see the father. The children, while looking into the tea, they see the cloud. And we should be able to see our father in every cell of our body scientifically speaking or not. You don't need to be a poet in order to see a cloud floating in this sheet of paper. Without a cloud, no tree can grow and no paper is possible. So that is uh, the teaching of interbeing. You cannot be by yourself alone. You have to interbe with all of us. The sheet of paper has to interbe with the tree with the sunshine, with the rain, and so on. So if, uh, if you think that the father is one person and the son is another person, that's the wrong view. You cannot remove father from son. If you remove father from son, son ceases to exist. And when you get angry at your father, you get angry at yourself because you are the continuation of your father. You are your father. You have no self. You have no separate self. Son and father are only conventional designations like the dollar and, or the euro. They have no uh, uh, self nature. So looking deeply into father, you see son and daughter. Looking in these two son and daughter, you see father and mother. You into are without one, there can be no other. And with that kind of insight, you see the happiness of the father is very important for the happiness of the son. And the suffering of the son is at the same time the suffering of the father. And that kind of view is the right view because there is no discrimination, discrimination between left and right, lotus and mud, father and son. This is to, come, to be cultivated by meditation. To meditate means to have the time to look, look deeply and discover the nature of interbeing. You cannot be by yourself alone. You have to interbe with the whole cosmos. That is true with the one flower, that is true with uh, one human being. Suppose you have the notion human being. The human being cannot be without other species. And this is the, this is the teaching of the Diamond Sutra. 
you have to remove the notion of self, the notion of uh, uh, human being, the notion of uh, uh, living beings, and the notion of uh, lifetime. The second notion is human being, because the human being is made only of non-human elements. Man is made of non-man elements. When you look into a flower, With mindfulness and concentration, you discover that a flower is made only of non-flower elements. There is sunshine in it, a sunshine is not flower. There is a cloud in it, and cloud is not flower. The soil, the minerals, the rain, the, the gardener, the whole cosmos have come together in order to help the flower to manifest as a wonder of life. And we know that a flower cannot be by herself alone. She has to interbe with the sunshine, with the rain, the soil, and everything. So the human man is the same. When you look into man, you see that man is made only of non-man elements. And it is easy enough to see it. We have uh, human ancestors. But we, we also have uh, animal ancestors. We are a very new species on Earth. Not only we have human ancestors, but we have uh, animal ancestors. And we have vegetal ancestors. We have uh, mineral ancestors. It means man is made of non-man elements. And if you don't know how to protect non-man elements, man will disappear. And that is uh, the sutra that can be considered to be um, the most ancient text on deep ecology. You have to remove the, the notion man of man as some of something that can be by itself alone. No. Man cannot be without animals, plants, and minerals. You are made of non-man elements. And that is why for the survival of the of man, you have to take care of the survival of animals, vegetables, and minerals. So right view is a kind of insight that removes all kind of discrimination. Man and animals and vegetables and minerals. And when you are free from discrimination, You begin to understand. You understand. You understand the suffering inside of you. You understand the suffering in the other person. And understanding suffering gives rise to compassion. So on the on the foundation of right view, you produce thoughts full of uh, understanding and compassion, thoughts entirely free from discrimination and fear. That is the practice of right thinking. So a good practitioner is uh, someone who is capable of producing a thought of understanding and compassion a thought that is totally free from discrimination. Not only racial discrimination uh, and other kind of discrimination 
relating to society. But discrimination uh, between father and son, uh, north and south, inside and outside, suffering on an object, uh, matter and energy, uh, subject, uh, uh, beginning and ending, birth and death. And right view is the kind of insight that cannot be learned from book or Dharma talks. <laughs> right view is the kind of uh, direct understanding that you get from the practice of mindfulness and concentration. Right mindfulness right concentration you learn how to live your life mindfully when you mop the floor you do it mindfully when you cook your breakfast you do it mindfully when you drive your car you do it mindfully when you walk from the parking lot to your office you walk mindfully and by doing so you generate the energy of mindfulness and concentration. And because you have mindfulness and concentration, insight continue to come until you get the deepest insight, the insight of no birth and no death, no being and no non-being. And by that time, every thought that you produce will be in the line of right thinking. When you produce a thought full of hate and despair, it's not good for your health. As soon as you produce a thought of hate and despair, it begins to, to harm your body and harm the world. Especially when a group of people produce wrong kind of thinking like that, full of hate, and despair is very dangerous. A thought full of anger and despair can lead someone to kill himself or to kill someone else. But a thought of understanding and compassion that you produce begin to heal yourself and heal the world right away. And that is why as a good practitioner, we should be able to produce many thoughts like that every day. Thoughts full of understanding and compassion. And free from all kinds of discrimination. And someone who produces thoughts of compassion and understanding, that someone does not suffer. We suffer because we do not have understanding and compassion. Without understanding and compassion, we are utterly cut off. We cannot relate to any living beings. But looking deeply, getting the insight of uh, interbeing, every thought you produce will be full of understanding and compassion that can heal yourself and help heal the world. No hate is uh, possible anymore. No separation, no despair is, is there anymore because you are capable of producing thoughts in the direction of right thinking, full of love, full of compassion, full of understanding. And then with uh, right view, what you say will be described as a right speech. If you do not have any discrimination, if you are full of understanding and compassion, what you write in your letter can heal you and heal the other person. The other person has not read your email yet. But during the time you write the email, you are full of understanding and compassion, and your letter has already begun to heal yourself. And a good practitioner 
should all should write letters like that every day for self healing and healing the world. When you say something, you are full of understanding and compassion that inspire confidence, that help a pers- person to get out of difficulties. Because what you say is full of understanding and compassion. And we should address our partner, our children, our friends, always with uh, right speech, no discrimination. And when you, are able, when you are able to say something compassionate, you feel wonderful. And what you say is healing you and will heal the other person. The other person may, may, may read your letter uh, a few hours later, but the letter has been written and it has begun to heal you and help you feel uh, uh, happy because you are able to open yourself and to, uh, to, uh, uh, to produce the energy of uh, happiness and compassion uh, to offer to the other person. And with right view, you are also capable of, of uh, producing the third aspect of your action is uh, right action. This is the kind of action performed by your body. Thinking is already action. Thinking might kill or might save. Speaking also is an action. Because speaking might kill or might save. Uh, Bodily action also can either protect, save, support or destroy. So a good practitioner with her body, she can protect living beings, she can uh, protect the environment, she can uh, uh, relieve the suffering, uh, poverty, uh, injustice and so on. So this is uh, this is what we produce every day. A human being produces a lot of these three things. And we should not believe that this body is us. No, we are much, much more than this body. We should not believe that when this body disintegrates, we are no longer there. That's wrong view. Even a cloud cannot die. How can you die? So every day you produce thoughts, speech, and and that is your true continuation. It's like the rain is the continuation of the cloud. If the cloud is acid, and the rain will be acid. So if you produce thought of compassion and understanding, speech of compassion and uh, loving kindness, action full of compassion and understanding, you are assuring you a beautiful future. Nothing can die. Your thought, your word, your action continue to be you. It's like the rain and the tea continue the cloud. You can never die. And this we call karma. Yep. So we are rather our action than our body. We have body, feelings, perceptions, mental formation, consciousness, with which we create our action. And our action continue us always. After even after this action of this body. There is a French uh, philosopher whose name is uh, Jean Paul Sartre. He said something very close. He said, man is the sum of his action. 
l'âme est la somme de ses actes. L'homme, main, est la somme de ses actes. So that is, this is the, his de, definition of man. Man is his action. And man can assure a continuation, a good continuation, by practicing right thinking, right speech, and right action. We have mentioned uh, all the six elements of the eight noble path. There is only two left, which is uh, right livelihood, and right delusions. We may talk about this tomorrow. And uh, please know that the five mindfulness trainings presented today is a very concrete expression of the noble, noble Eighth Full Path. That is the path of well-being. Every step taken on that path should generate well-being, happy, happiness, and joy. So let us have enough time to look together deeply into the teaching of the Buddha as how to be happy, as how to make good use of the suffering in order to create joy and peace. <laughs>